consultant, a cost accountant and certified information security auditor with over 25 years of professional experience. She heads the Tata Motors Global Delivery Center that supports the group in end-to-end -end business process management and knowledge services. Thank you, Aarti, for coming. <coughs> Prashray Kala. Or is it Kala? Sorry. Prashray Kala, Practice Director, Everest Group. Prashray leads the Everest Group's work with R&D, technology and healthcare global delivery organizations in enabling innovation and creating value addition. And uh, Sanket Deshpande. Mr. Sanket Deshpande, Head, IT and Process Excellence, Mahindra Integrated Business Solutions. A Master's in Computer Management and Finance. Sanket holds expertise in techno-functional transformations where process re-engineering is done with the objective of eliminating non-value ads, creating self-help mechanism and automating to bring efficiencies without human dependency. So it's over to Mr. Anirban Roy to moderate this session. Am I audible? Good afternoon. How does the food still sinking in? Good afternoon. Okay, so let me make it a little bit more interactive with the audience. I have to wake everyone up. That's what I've been told. Wake everyone up. This panel has to be an exciting one. Quick show of hands. How many of you in your organizations have something digital in their platform, process, capability? You have something digital, however you define. Okay, right. keep, keep it up, keep it up, keep the, keep the hand up, <laughs> just stay awake, right? How many of you on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being extremely digital and 1 being abysmally digital, are more than 5 in terms of digital in your organization? Ah, lots of hands are dropping. How many of you, keep the hands up, keep the hands up. How many of you position yourself as a digital talent attractor in the marketplace when you go to campus of a high more hands have come down. That's one hand remaining. <laughs> okay, so I, I won't put you on the spot. I, I promise I won't put you on the spot. This is actually a great, great uh, setting for the way we want to kind of uh, have the discussion today. Point is the digital quotient aspect of it and how it's driving business performance across all of our shared services and business processes. <laughs> the interesting part, which I just did with this little interactive exercise is a lot of companies and organizations today believe in doing digital and I repeat doing digital but not necessarily being digital and that's where one of the fundamental differences arise and I will ask the panelists to opine on that in just a second and then the other thing is today most companies and organizations look for talent by virtue of their IQ or EQ let's turn it around what if talent starts looking at companies on their DQ and decides where to join depending on where the DQ is? How do we then rank ourselves? A lot of us put our hands down when we accept more than five. But probably not. So the whole paradigm of being digital, being able to ensure that it's aligned with business priorities and then becoming the place when it comes to is what we'll try and unravel today. So, as, as I get into the topic, let me actually kind of uh, paint the picture with some quick facts that I picked up from a McKinsey study and then I'll open it up to the uh, panel. First of all, a large number of companies today have a digital strategy available, but like I said, they may be only doing digital as a tick in the box versus being digital. Secondly, a lot of companies invest in capabilities that may or may not align with the overall business strategy that's been laid out at the very top. Third, a strong and adaptive culture to complement the capabilities of digital is missing in a large number of companies today. And fourth, but not the least, is a lot of org structures when they look at things like KPIs and talent do not necessarily have a digital quotient even on their scorecards to measure how good or bad they are and to take a cue from Romy's point earlier is a DQ of 10, 20, 80, 150 the right number? No one really knows. 
So with that, let me uh, come to you, Arti, for the first uh, thing and get your opinion on it. Is this whole concept of digital or digital quotient, how we define it, how do you, if somebody was to come up and ask you, Arti, what is this digital thing? Can you help it make it real for us? Love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah good afternoon. Uh, again, this is my definition, uh, uh, and, uh, because everybody, if you ask within Tata Motors also, everybody would have their own definitions. For me, digital is, uh, you know, thinking. In your thinking, you have to think for business winning, yeah? And if you are thinking in that direction, whatever uh, processes that you would put in, whatever technologies that you would put in, uh, whatever means you will uh, adopt to reach to that destination, uh, you will be digital in your approach in the current scenario. Uh, we have heard in the morning uh, Romy speak and all other panelists speak, everybody is talking about value creation. Yeah. So if whether being uh, digitalizing your processes or digitizing your processes rather than getting into uh, which end of the spectrum you are, if you are able to bring in the value proposition, very solid value proposition which is going to impact the customer experience, which is going to impact your bottom line, then I would say, you know, you are on the journey of being digital. That's my definition to that. Thank you, Arti. And Sanket, if I can kind of get you into the conversation here. Quick thing, she touched upon the word thinking. Right. And I know a lot of people tend to dovetail things like design thinking and all these new age concepts into the whole digital framework. From a Mahindra standpoint, I'd love to get your perspective on not just how you're doing digitally, but more importantly, what is the organization thinking making the digital aspect align with business strategy. So hello everyone. Um, I think what she said is pretty right. Uh, so first the organization has to think that they, they are supposed to be a digital organization. Otherwise if they don't think there is no way they can become a digital uh, organization. So I'll take back a few decades or probably a few years wherein it actually started that Industries were more labor inten intensive earlier, where labor are the primary focus of any organization. Then machine changed that perspective. More machines have come and less labors were there. So the organization has moved from labor to machine. Uh, the organization has to look at more machines than labor. Then the area comes when the industry changed, there is certainly a technological changes that happened and everyone started going into a digital way. The technology change happened last 10, 15 years. So when you are looking at change from a machine which is predominant earlier to a digital. Now this process when you look at from an organization point of view is a huge change. Not everyone, everyone has the ability or, or skill set to look after that. When you are saying that the people and the organization has to think, it is more on the side that whether they are able to achieve that digital enterprise or not. When I am saying digital enterprise is something that they feel that I need to change. Lot of organization has, uh, I am probably in, we also faced that when we initially started it, that people are not very, you know, open to change. Even if you are bringing technologies to get into smoother processes, they know that there are chances that they may, they may not be existing in that organization as well. So the thinking in the organization has to change, there is complete change management that needs to be done. Without that there can't be a digital change. You can force a change but to a, to a limit. You can't actually use that technology for an entire 100% unless we have people to accept it. So I think a lot of, uh, when we started the journey it is basically the people who we have to train, who we have to understood that this is something that is beneficial to them uh, rather than uh, they are uh, you know, fear of losing their job. So from Mahindra point, uh, point of view, when we started the shared services, it is more on the digital side, specifically to cater not only the internal processes, but to look at how it helps the entire journey of Mahindra as a group. 
when you are looking at that there are suppliers there are you know uh, internal departments and char and employee it's not limited to a certain department or it's not limited to a certain process it is an overall perspective of an organization which needs to be defined that if i have to go digital i want every small thing which has to be there needs to be digital so i'm actually uh, thank you for that and i'm glad you brought in the whole aspect of change and you know i think you mentioned training and achievement etc yeah. so uh, prerna if i can get you in here from your perspective as a leader of this entire business or vertical if you will how do you call all the troops and get the people going digital or rarrying this whole digital jargon across the length and breadth of the organization yeah sure so So I think uh, it all stems from strategy. I know my earlier two speakers have spoken about strategy, but um, uh, you know, but I think it's very important. And I, uh, you know, in my organization, Financial Services State Street Corporation, we are very focused on what does digital mean, and we're not going to do something because it's, uh, uh, you know, it has to make sense for the business we are in. It has to make sense for the industry we are in, and it has to all sort of tie together. So, so we look at. we look at digital from uh, from two aspects one is the whole enablement aspect you know so what is the enablement what is the internal uh, you know processes internal platforms internal how do we make ourselves smarter leaner faster all of that and second is what is our digital strategy as far as the marketplace is concerned you know uh, and here i'm i'm uh you know not limiting myself to only shared services organization but as a large organization so what is our strategy our digital strategy and we all know that there is disruption as far as the marketplace the clients customer acquisition all of that products for the market uh, marketplace for products uh, so in, in the financial services industry that i'm in it, it you know all of these there are there are non financial services companies that are disrupting the marketplace now there is there has been a lot of threat you know perceived threat that you know um, our financial services companies uh, do they need to be technology companies uh, uh, you know before they become financial services companies or do they need to be financial services companies and use technology uh, to get ahead in the marketplace and it's a, it's a debate that's still going on and it's a very valid debate and i think different companies are positioning themselves differently uh but it is very important to sort of separate these two enablement digitization or enablement digital quotient and the marketplace uh, uh you know digital quotient so one is inside and one is uh, one is outside one is focused on uh you know uh, you know cost uh, and leaner and uh, faster the other is how do we win in the marketplace what you know what are my innovative products what is my distribution channel what is uh you know what what do i need to do so i think all of this comes together so once we have that whole uh, articulation very clearly uh, laid out um you know then and it it uh, it sounds very simple but it sort of varies by uh, by every company because each company works in a different environment works in a different set of constraints and has a different positioning in the marketplace now state street being a financial services company you know we are in the b2b segment you know we are not a retail bank we are not in the consumer lending space so we we very clearly recognize that that's the place you know and our uh, economic and uh, marketplace environment is different so therefore uh, our digital strategy needs to be different um so once we have a clear vision of that and i think my earlier speakers and you one of the points you have uh, that you want to touch upon later on is the culture so then once you have the strategy once you figured out you know uh, you know how you want to play in it and then from there you emanate uh, you know what's the culture i want to create and how is it that i uh, how is it that we actually uh, make that happen um and culture is is absolutely culture talent uh, is absolutely uh, organization structures you know we might not give it as much importance but if you don't set up the structures appropriately um, you know then uh, you know then you may not be able to deliver uh, on what you want to deliver um, you know customer journeys so i think the industry that i am in is beginning to think about these um, uh, you know journeys so it's no longer uh, you know i am this product department i am this product department i am this product 
you know, so if you have 10 products, you have 10 product departments, each one has their own process, each one has their own customer. But, but beginning to think about it from who is the end user, who is the end customer that you want to service. For instance, if it is the customer, then you build your organization around customer journeys. If it is uh, your employees that you're dealing with in a straight services em environment, then you build your organization, your systems processes as employee journeys. Hire to retire, no longer finance department does payroll, no longer um, uh, you know, uh, exit process someone else does. So bringing these, uh, these like-minded journeys, supplier, you know, if supplier is an external party you deal with, then what is the journey of that supplier and how do you make it, sh uh, you know, how do you sort of use this digital quotient to make it more, uh, you know, crisp and so I think that is some of the thinking that we have. Yeah, and I think uh, it's, it's an important point because every organization is so different. So, you know, one size doesn't fit all. In fact, uh, we at our value group often talk about, you know, there's a difference between being best in class versus best in context. So how do you contextualize the actual digital solution for different companies because every company will have its own thing. So um, Prashab, if I come to you, uh, uh, ma'am, I'll take a cue from your point in the morning, you know, people process technology and people always first, <laughs> in, in that order, right? So I'm adding the word digital to it, digital people, digital process, digital technology. How important is digital people? Thanks, Sonic. Uh, yes, I think as you mentioned, right, people remains first for most of the enterprises. Um, and as part of Everest Group, we are exposed to so many GICs and enterprises. Um, in the last year itself, we would have held 30 plus GICs and enterprises in their evolution journey. And digital quotient, as you described, and people was, I would say, foremost in the priorities almost everywhere. Uh, now, with digital people, I think uh, oftentimes people misunderstand this about just new talent. Uh, there's a large component of upskilling, reskilling, using your existing uh, people who have the deep domain knowledge also. Uh, we've seen some of our clients struggle with uh, mapping that this talent also who work with them can also be uh, the future digital talent for them, right? Uh, so I'll. When I, when I uh, talk through, I'll talk through some of the uh, best-in-class examples I saw through over the last two years, right? Uh, so if you're talking about talent and we divide it into, let's say, what work you do for existing talent versus how do you acquire new talent. Now, on the existing talent side, we work with one of the top five global companies, uh, top five global technology companies based out of Hyderabad, the GICs in Hyderabad. Uh, what they started was is creating a well thought through digital talent demand plan. Uh, this was not just the GIC's own vision, but how this married with the global enterprise, what products they plan to launch, what technologies this would use. Once they had the entire demand planning in place, then they, ident then they worked on to a skill registry for their existing employees. Now, the challenge which they were facing is that they did know about the people who were working under them. Uh, but often by the roles and responsibilities and technology departments and product groups, as you described, uh, but not by the skill sets which they had. Uh, then there is a gap on what are the skill sets which they need training on. So what are the available trainings which, could, uh, which they could work on? So when they worked with what are the existing skills, what are the possibilities of skill training which can be provided, each people manager then had to fill in for their own uh, reportees uh, on how does the digital skills stack up, how this would look two to three years from now. Based on that, they were able to get a very quantitative view as well, which, uh, which we find in a surprisingly few organizations on how actually, what would be the projected gap in demand for digital talent after a few years. Uh, so getting a skill registry for the existing employees and using that as a gap identification for training was something which we found uh, very well implemented in this organization. Uh, we then worked with them to identify, so now when the possible trainings were listed out, it was not just the GIC themselves prescribing to the employees of what trainings which they should take, but the employees could pick up from bucket list of uh, possible trainings. And what this helped is, not only is it giving you digital talent at scale uh, from your existing employees, but this is also acting as a tremendous retention lever for the employees, and its attrition also reduced over a period of time. 
uh, if I have to talk about attracting new talent, and this was a technology company, they didn't face challenges about being branded as a digital uh, employer. Uh, but we, we worked with another manufacturing and automotive services, uh, GIC, recently. Uh, their challenge was they were not being perceived as a technology or a digital company when they were, be, uh, when they were going to campuses. They worked on an entire rebranding exercise right from the way in which they design or they roll out the, uh, let's say, the job descriptions, social media outreaches, campus engagement plans. Uh, they had campus engagement plans earlier, but they were not resulting in something which was creating an impact. So they were having hackathons, but uh, there was prize money associated with it. People used to come, win the prize money, leave, not much value to the organization, right? We help them, uh, and I'm sure most of you also are, are facing this, right, when you go to campuses. So how to change that to see something which could more end up result in partnerships, potential small term engagements, uh, pre-placement interviews for the talent. Um, then continuous branding throughout the year at the campus. Uh, so it's not just one hackathon and you're done with that campus, but more a long-term engagement. Uh, I think the one thing which they said worked best for them is when instead of going to the campus, they had the students come to their site, uh, actually seeing how the teams worked. Uh, and they had to work a lot on their culture, right? Uh, this is, again, an automotive and manufacturing services company, maybe not so swanky offices as some of the banking GICs. Uh, I might disagree with you there on that, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll let you continue. Yeah, some of them <laughs> actually do, right? Uh, in this case, the client, and I'm not naming them, they didn't. Um, so, but when this new talent came in, um, they were just trained on the new digital skills. They were not burdened with the legacy trainings. Ended up happening after six, nine months is that the average age for the digital focus team which they had based on these new employees was low. Uh, innovation was very fast. Uh, the culture was very different in this team. So again, these are two very different examples. One which focused more on existing employees, the other which focused on new employees. I think the right path is somewhere between that. Uh, but so it fact, needs to be just uh, taking yeah. a cue on since you mentioned the automotive industry and uh, I'd love your thoughts on this I mean for a long long time the automotive industry is seen as very high end in terms of automation in the plants and the SMD areas etc right how do you from your perspective see that same euphoria come up within the shared services forum because that's obviously different from putting nuts and bolts fixing wheels onto the automobiles so anything you can share uh, to Prashra's point in terms of the inside out how do you ensure that the existing talent becomes digitally not savvy but digitally more capable yeah so it's uh, you know kind of uh, story that i can share about uh, how gdc was set up uh, so, you know, Tata Motors had uh, so-called shared services right from 90s. So, we were, you know, when shared service as a term was coined, we started that. But that was more of a centralized uh, accounts payable and uh, payroll kind of activity. And there were around 100 odd people that time who were working in uh, shared services. When we formed uh, GDC six years back, uh, we definitely inherited that because being Tata's, uh, you know, we, we took that entire team and our age group that time average age was 50, yeah. Today the average age is uh, 28 and we have 2600 people, yeah. Now, a uh, lot of work happened in these six years. And uh, it's not only what we added in terms of services and end-to-end -end processes, we changed the entire culture, thinking, mindset of the people. Yeah? And I would agree to uh, his point that um, the people have to keep changing and challenging yeah, to the business problems that are there, uh, to the business problems that are there. Uh, so we don't hire from market we would hire very very selectively what we do is we train our guys because what they already have is a very deep understanding of automobile industry and a very deep understanding of the business priorities now thankfully for us we are the parent organization and we service the entire group so we are closer to the parent uh, XCOM and the managing director and we understand the business priorities as I said since the team has been with us for very long there is a deep 
knowledge and priorities that that these guys understand so if you expose them to the digital thinking digital way of doing things it's far more superior than bringing in you know only the technologies or bringing in fresh talent from the market and you know trying to train them on business context so for us what has worked is having a healthy mix yeah few newcomers who bring in the startup mentality and training the old timers who had the spark but very rich business understanding change their mindset thank yeah? you arti so uh, i just uh, ask a quick question of prerna and then we'll come to the audience for one or two questions then we'll continue the discussion so prerna one quick thing and it's a challenge with the door organization space saying I as a leader am very passionate about digital so I'm making that as my number one priority you know it's going to get me all the various wonderful things across the team but you as my peer and maybe other members of the leadership team do not necessarily have digital as the first priority how do you work collectively at a leadership level to align business priorities both digitally as well as non digitally so that it truly becomes a change agent for the entire organization yeah, so again I think it stems from business strategy you know so it stems from the overall um, uh, you know context and direction that the organization the ceo sets for the organization um, you know and uh, i can tell you uh, you know state street is a 225 year old company and has survived the rot of time the onslaught of uh, different business models and all of that and uh, uh, you know and every time you just have to reinvent yourself uh, reinvent yourself have a business strategy reinvent yourself have a direction and uh, and garner teams to come around it uh, not easy done but when there is an external market threat uh, you know it becomes much easier you know so uh, so there have been studies that say at least in the financial services uh, industry there is a uh, you know uh, obsolescence rate uh is very high because you know you you don't really have uh you know your processes and your people are really your product um you know and uh, uh so you know in, in fact one study that i read said almost 28 to 30% um of businesses might fail uh you know if they don't stay ahead of the game so it starts from business strategy starts from direction um and then you know have organization structures that uh, you know that support that um and that that is the only that is the only uh, and in our industry it is people you know eventually uh, it is people it is their um you know uh, adaptability and their drive to change and drive change within the teams uh you know that is just so important and overpowering because um, uh, you know what else uh, you know money is no longer in the financial services you know what else uh, is there and um, you know so i think you know everything that everyone has said about people it is it is the building fundamental building block of how you drive this change across the organization thank you prerna maybe we we'll take one or two question audience and then come back to the discussion again any questions as a hand at the back and uh, second thing is like we might choose to focus on a certain area but the larger employee base you have statistically speaking the probability lowers uh, in this case of the client i was talking about uh, the skill areas obviously uh, now when the entire skill map was being built it was not just new skills which was contributing to the skill portfolio of the employee uh, based on what skills they already had which project are they working on so if they are working on uh, let's say cloud engineering project for a period of 3 months 9 months different points to that skill registry got added so as i said uh, the objective of this particular client was to make it more quantifiable uh they had the different point system depending on intensity of the project duration of the project as well as of the trainings and of past experience um as i said if you leave it entirely open then obviously aligning it with the vision set is a bit difficult but you can't be fully prescriptive as well as in dictate to employees of what they should train on in this case as i mentioned earlier this was being uh managed by the people managers for their direct reportees so there was 
a consultative discussion on what fits best for the employee as well as for the organization. And that worked out to be better. I think getting that right balance was the most important for this particular client. Can I just add our sure. experience to this? Uh, so I'll tell you about how we have done it and that specifically answers the second part of your question in terms of you know how do you identify projects. Probably if you go in that route, that would be inappropriate way to do that. Uh, because firstly you need to have a problem on hand which you want to resolve yeah then you will talk about the technology and the people to resolve that yeah so if you first train your people and then say okay now I want blockchain related problems that may not be the right thing to do uh, so the way we do this is we have uh, listed down whole lot of projects there are around two, 280 projects as we speak which are running yeah which are all in the digital space and uh, our commitment to our management last year we had our uh, vision GDC 2.0 wherein uh, you know everybody nowadays talks about uh, in the morning also we heard that you know talking about how big you are uh, in terms of shared service those days are gone now people have to talk about what is the degrowth that you are doing so last year we committed that you know we will reduce by 50 percent and uh, by March 20 and now we are nearing March 20 and we are exceeding our target so so that was the audacity of the challenge that we took okay if we have so many people worth of work okay let's look at the processes and let's eliminate the human part of it and and that's how all these projects came in uh, to service those projects what were the best technologies and uh, uh, tools that were required to be uh, uh, deployed was identified yeah the prime focus was to change it within the ERP system. So for us, SAP for 99, 95% of the work happens in SAP. So if something is better done in SAP, then you better go and do it there. And then otherwise, if it is cost prohibitive, time prohibitive, then you look at other means to do that. Yeah? And that is how all these projects came out. And then people were trained on those specific areas, be it RPA, be it AI, be it ML, be, be it UI, UX, whatever you talk about. And then, you know, people picked up whatever they had. So that is how we, ha we are doing it. So I think I have a different view as well. So uh, there are other, uh, so the third way, I think they have already shared the two ways. The third way, what we have done in our, uh, because we serve to almost, 16, 18 industries, being Mahindra Group uh, shared services. And uh, uh, not only to Mahindra Group, it is an external client as well. So what we what we felt is, uh, since it is pro, uh, predominantly a process oriented, uh, uh, any any company has more processes. We What we have done is we created a group of people inside, let's say for HR, let's say finance. What we have ask them to do is let us look at processes which they feel is very important and they feel is right uh, in their perspective which can be changed. Now it is what we are looking at it is reskilling when when we are saying that they, there is a time to be uh, taken for a process let's say it's over let's say five hours of time for a process what they feel are the areas where they can they can reduce the time it is something in their own domain once we do that, once they define that this is something, these are the areas where I want to change or uh, probably we can reduce the time of working, we then ask them we, what are the technologies do you feel? We, we have given them technologies which are available. What, we have asked them to look at technology which suffice their requirement. Now it is something by way of involving them into a process of selecting a technology as well which will help them to reduce the entire time. We are actually reskilling them. So next time when we do that, they are able to show that what we have done, it is a similar way they can do for other processes as well. So in each of the department when you are scaling, it is basically known that these people will have become from a domain expert to a techno functional expert. When they are looking at it, it is simply a small reskilling that we have to done. Now they are very well versed of RPA. Some of them are working in AI as well because they are into the same process but looking at the technology as part of their own processes. Thank you. 
I would do exactly what we have done <laughs> because I don't think we are wrong. Uh, so to be honest, in, in one and a half year, to reduce your service delivery headcount by 50% is a very, very big challenge which we have taken. And if we were not right, we wouldn't have achieved this. Yeah. So I think whatever, I mean, multiple things, I wouldn't say only one thing, because as I said at the beginning of this, digital is not only about technology. Yeah? Uh, your decisions with respect to people, decisions with respect to processes, decisions with respect to technology, decisions with respect to change management, strategies, stakeholder convincing, everything included will bring in the necessary impact. Otherwise, what will happen is you will only deploy technologies or you will have successful POCs and pilots, but you will not have the, the business case realization, which you show and you get the uh, budgets for. So we have done this and we are seeing the business benefit. The impact of that gets calculated, monitored, reported at the highest level in the organization. So I think uh, all these things put together, we are on the right track. I don't think <laughs> I would change anything. I'll, I'll share examples of a couple of clients. But uh, you want to say what Arti could have done differently? No, no. <laughs> when we talk to uh, GIC clients of ours, the, the biggest regret which they have is not trying on few areas. Uh, and it's difficult to get that mentality of fail fast, fail cheap, right? I mean, uh, we are very risk averse uh, generally in the GIC industry. Uh, we had a client which regretted that it could have grown big data capabilities, but that got set up in San Francisco. We had another client regret that they could have scaled up automation and provided great value add to the global enterprise but that work got delivered by a vendor just because they didn't show initiative on the time. So I think the biggest regret which I have heard is just not trying on a few areas. So I think, as you mentioned, be bold, try a lot of things, uh, but also be very uh, cautious of the fact on what is the threshold of investment and time and output which you expect. So I think that monitoring has to be done very carefully. Thank you, Prashay. So, so uh, to your point, I think that is, that is very important because uh, especially in a GIC environment, because GIC is typically uh, a cost center, right? So this, uh, uh, you know, the ROI of trying something assumes a totally different context and meaning. And, uh, and I can share examples where, um, you know, this uh, RPA, the most talked about RPA, um, uh, you know, and in a lot of cases, we found that the ROI just doesn't stack up. Uh, it could have stacked up had this process been done in a high cost location. But the minute you're doing it here in a low cost environment, there is a lot of advantage you can get by streamlining the process, doing some lean work, you know, uh, process uh, harmonization, standardization, whatever else. And before, you know, because benefit realization is a different uh, you know, how do you, how do you take two hours of each one's time and say that, you know, does that become one person that I can reduce out of a five person process? Probably not. But you can do a very swanky POC and you can do a very, um, uh, you know, you can have a tick in the box which says RPA, you know, the greatest, <coughs> in the greatest in the industry today is done. But really, how does that translate uh, into benefit realization and an ROI perspective? I think that's um, critical. Thank you, Perna. Maybe one more question, then we'll come back to the discussion. Yeah, I see another hand at the back. Hi, I'm Vikas. Uh, just a slightly controversial question. For you know, so I think it is uh, first, you know, fastest finger first kind of a thing. You know, so shared services can become the delivery of all these new innovative stuff. You know, so while you move away from all the processing and all of that, but, uh, but uh, you know, but that can be the new avatar of shared services. But then you have to be bold in taking those decisions of trying out and saying, we'll do it for the rest of the organization. We have the wherewithal. We have the uh, knowledge. We have the skills. This is about, you know. So, so, you know, why would the organization not look at shared services 
to be the digital arm for the whole business. And it is just about the way we position it. It's just about the way we, uh, uh, you know, be bold about it. And I think uh, at least in State Street, we've been able to a uh, little bit get to that level to say that we'll support, uh, you know, all reporting capability. You know, we know it. We will, we will not just do, uh, you know, the re generation of reports, but we will uh, do all of your digitization of reports. So it's, it's just a, uh, it's just a little bit about your. Uh, you know, dream your, uh, you know, how you position it and uh, the energy, passion around it and the boldness with which you can, uh, you know, take that on. Can I just yes, add? Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it depends on uh, how, how you are doing it. So in GDC, when we set it up, it was always, uh, you know, we never, none of us ever had headcount increase or revenue increase as our uh, BSC targets. It was always value creation. So if that is the strategy with which you have built your uh, GIC or GCC, it will never change. Yeah, you will change your format the way we have changed it. It was we had service delivery and we had uh, uh, knowledge functions uh, originally that was the bifurcation now that is getting blurred yeah while there are centers of excellence so you have information and analytics as one solid deliverable going out from your you have digital transformations as another big uh, thing that is going out from here but it is the service delivery team which is picking up some of these large scale projects and driving those and bringing in the digital quotient in the organization because these small teams cannot handle so much of a disruption so the disruption uh, happens even within your delivery organization and the 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 what they deliver to the rest of the organization changes from being looked at as a transaction processing unit to a value provider first there has to be a mindset change in the minds of the people that I am not doing accounts payable yeah I am here to change the process if that we are able to bring in I think we are uh, there's no change per se it remains the GIC remains <laughs> thank you Arti. so let me come back to the panel and maybe Sankar I can start with you this time uh, you have a crystal ball in front of you and my question for you is, how digital do you want to be? How do you see this evolving both for Mahindra as well as industry-wide? And I'll come back to the rest of the panelists as well. So, so when you say technology, technology is, if you look at, it has, it's a coin. It has an advantage, it has a disadvantage. When you use technology to advantage of an enterprise, you go into a success mode where you, where you are not able to get to an advantage, it fails. So from an from a organization point of view or an industry point of view, tomorrow if you want to uh, be a digital organization, it is something that what you want to see is what are what all processes that we are, which are basically very streamlined, very simplified, less efforts, but it has, it has the greater impact whether to a customer, whether you are into customer uh, B2C or B2B as well. The customer experience is very important when you are going digital, how your customer perceived you, what is your, uh, what is your timelines to give them back, how soon you can reach to customers. If you are, service, you are into services industry, how soon you can survive, look at Amazon and uh, Flipkart as well. Let me, let me jump in real quick there. So I know uh, Romy gave a great example yeah. earlier today saying, you know, machines would be working for machines. Right. Which would order vegetables for us. Right. Do you see that I, sort of digitalization I, like even in industries and companies? To be frank, I in near future I don't see that because I I do see that it is going to be more technology, but people will remain there. You cannot change people. Every process will have people. You may have hundred now, you may have ten. But you cannot change you know, you cannot replace people. So when I'm looking at digital as a part, I am also looking at the capability of the people, capability of organization being digital, capability of organization being reaching out to customer, how, uh, you know, the, uh, the reaching time, how easily your market can reach you, how 
easy for you to adopt to new technologies? When you are saying that, when you are looking at an organization point of view, it is very important and digital question, uh, these are four factors which we, uh, when you define a digital question, is what is your adaptability to new technologies? What, what is your reach to your customers? How your customers foresee you? The third is, do you have the right technologies as well? And fourth, which, which is most important is, what is the culture? And when you are saying that all this, you have a certain level of maturity, then you become a certain digital company. A lot of, even we, we are not at a higher level of digital. We have, we started journey almost three, three years back. We are at a stage where people are very much aware to what is digital. They are taking interest into making, you know, changes into their own processes. We have already gone in ahead and reaching out to customer through digital ways. So that is there. But it is still not that level where we are supposed to be. And that level is where I am able to reach to all customer that I have in uh, my market. I am able to give right technology to my uh, employees or my organization. Because the technology keeps changing every and then. The right, and as a rightly said, Aarti and uh, Prashir also we made a very right point because it is a cost to your company. When you are putting technology or you are putting cost to an, you know get a technology, you need to have a strategy beyond two years. You cannot have a strategy for one year and invest into a technology. From a digital point of view, I think we are around seven. I, I still feel there are a lot of things to do. Me. Thank you. Prashtra, if I can pass the crystal ball over to you. Should sure. companies and industries be scared? <laughs> yes, and this is a question which we get asked a lot when we work with global enterprises. Uh, they ask us a question whether they should grow headcount in their global locations or rather put in that money in digital or automation. Right? Uh, if you ask again, statistically speaking, uh, seven years back, the headcount in India global services industry was growing by double digits and so was Philippines. If you see the last two years, the headcount growth in India was about 5 to 6 percent each year. Philippines was under 2 percent a year. So the headcount growth is definitely reducing year on year, right? Uh, but I completely agree with you when you say that in the next five years, we don't see headcount drastically reducing by half and machines taking over everything. Uh, but do we say that eventually we will not have machines doing most of the task? I wouldn't agree to that, right? I think machines would definitely uh, do a lot of tasks. There'd be a lot of uh, uh, human intervention which would be required at every stage. Then, see, in your current set of processes, yes, there will be a lot of optimization and usage of machines, but as the enterprise itself is veering its strategy and vision to more digital businesses, you would need people to propel the front side of the organization as well. And if GICs can be at that uh, cusp of change in which from they are able to help the enterprise itself transition to a more digital future uh, and revenue impact, I think that would work out great for all shared services in GIC industry. Prina, any thoughts from you? Yeah, so I, th I think the ambition of shared services has to uh, change a little bit, has to, uh, uh, you know, uh, we need to be in a place where we can drive change and digital strategy for the rest of uh, rest of the business. Um, uh, you know, flawless execution uh, is is uh, going to be par for the course. Uh, you know, I don't think there is any let go on that at all. Um, you almost always don't need to be the disruptor, but need to be. A, a fast adopter, uh, you know, because the time, effort, and money that's spent in uh, in disruption is a lot more than being the fast, you know, just fast adopter and flawless execution. And I think those are my crystal ball, uh, uh, you know, things for for shared services. Harti, save the best for the last. <laughs> Um, so I feel shared services is a mirror or a reflection of a larger uh, organization that you are serving, yeah. And uh, that will depend, uh, the, their strategy, their mindset towards being digital 
would get reflected into a shared services. I'll give Tata Motors example. Yeah. Earlier, Tata Motors was a fine engineering organization. As an organization, we used to take pride in, in delivering such a great engineering content in our uh, uh, vehicle that we would forget to sell it. Yeah? We would forget to you know, brand it well in the market. We forgot our customer. We were so happy with the product. Yeah? That mindset has changed. If you see uh, uh, the vehicles that are coming out now, it's a very clear reflection that the mindset of the organization is changing. Yeah? Organization is thinking of a customer. Organization is thinking mobility. Organization is thinking digital. Yeah? So I have a little different viewpoint of view. It depends on what is your organizational strategy of being digital. And that, that sits here. That doesn't sit in you know what technologies that you deploy so i feel mindset wise every automobile industry can completely disrupt itself and same goes true for the gic also uh, what could limit is our own capability to do that in terms of resources budgets people change management and all of that so yes in a in a short term definitely it cannot completely replace what you are doing, you know, machines cannot replace humans, but you can bring in large changes for sure, if you have the necessary, uh, you know, digital mindset. That's what I feel. Thank you. So maybe we have time for one more question from the audience. Yeah, I can see a hand under. Needed for your organization to survive. You always have to depend the external world to cater to your servi uh, services to you so that you actually can uh, uh, create a value inside your organization. So that relationship will be there. So the, the point that you have said, what will happen to an IPR and uh, you know, the, the uh, BCP. So it is every, every third party uh, you know, uh, company should have and that is when we deal with the third party uh, vendors, it is predominantly what we have the policies to look upon what kind of vendor should be on board. Now that is within an organization to decide what kind of requirement that you have, what kind of status that a, a, a vendor, third party whom you are going to deal with should have, whether he has the capacity to go for long, well, what is his, so due diligence comes in very important when you are looking at third party and the BCP. The IPR you cannot have because the product always remains the same. Unless you are a part of creating that product, you can share the IPR. But I don't think you can challenge an IPR for a third party application because that is their baby. The only thing that you can certainly look at is what is your due diligence process, what you want your third party vendors to give you, what are his ways of providing it and how do you go, if there are certain worst scenarios, how is that your third, third party vendor going to support you? I think that makes very important point when you have a due diligence policy at place in your organization. Thank you, Sanket. So uh, I know yeah. we're at time. So let me just quickly wrap this uh, engaging conversation. So clearly what came out was the people aspect or the talent aspect is critically vital as companies go into the next stage of digitalization. What's important is, you know, how is the adaptively going to be there? How do companies achieve common goals and how do you deploy the training so that people are both upskilled as well as there's good talent being attracted from outside in. The other thing we spoke about also is, you know, how do we ensure that there is flawless execution and best and fast adoption of the latest digital trends. So I'll close the uh, session with just one uh, quick uh, acronym which I picked up from a, a dear friend of mine who is heading digital at Dr. Eddy's. And he said that we would need to always do a, within quotes, dipstick to assess the digitalization state of a company. And in dipstick, dip stands for DIPP. The D is the data, which is the creativity with the available data. The I is the impact and the sustainability of what you're doing with that data and how you transformed it. The first P is all about partnership, which is with other business units, both within and outside. And finally, the big P is the people who will drive the whole digital mindset across into the new age. Thank you very much, panelists. Thank you, audience, for the questions.
Financial Assurance, ERP, and SSE from SLR to please come up and give a memento to Ms. Prerna Tandon. Mr. Neera Jain, Director of Finance.